Jr. There are unwritten rules in the barbershop, and the first rule is you never switch chairs. Am I right? Yeah. 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 The barbershop was built on loyalty. That's how it became the cornerstone of the community. Am I right? Yeah. 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 A scene out of blackish in the sacred spot for many black men and women, the magic shop. Over time, barbers and hairstylists have become somewhat like therapists to their clients in the black community. Here to talk about the hairstylist roles in black mental and emotional health, entrepreneur and barber Stefan, AKA Step the Barber, hairstylist and beauty influencer C. Scott, also known as Main Doll, licensed therapist Amber D, and our very own Kennedy Rue getting to the root of the discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. A new law in Tennessee is now requiring hairstylists to know the signs of domestic violence by taking a one hour free training. What do you think about this law that's happening and how it ties in with the experience that you notice in salons and barbershops? Stefan? I just wonder how, when you make something a law, mm. typically there's a penalty. Uh, and so I'm just wondering how responsible barbers and hairstylists will become in the situation where maybe they don't notice the signs and it's not reported. Um, it's an incredible amount of responsibility to be placed on someone that may not know the specifics and the ins and outs. But on the other hand, I do understand how important it is to, uh, if you see something, say something, you can help save a life. So there's a little bit of, you know, the yin and yang when it comes to that situation. It's very touchy. And C. Scott, for you, you're there to provide a service. You're also listening. How yes. do you balance between the two as a hairstylist? Well, me and my clients have developed a relationship, so it's more like a sisterhood. So to his point, I do I do agree with it. Like it's like it can be heavy to have to have that responsibility on you. But um, when you do have that relationship with your clients or it's like that's something that you, you will notice or you hope not to look past. Being a barber specializing in women's short hair, um, women come in and get their hair cut for all types of reasons. They could be dealing with alopecia, um, but one of the most recent situations, there was a woman who wanted to get her, get her hair cut by me, um, and she said she was tired of her husband using her hair as a weapon against her. Mm -hmm. And she spoke about how he would drag her around the house by her hair. Um, and so I had to step out of the, my position as a barber at that moment and just ask her, you know, do you think that by cutting your hair that this is something that could further anger him? Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the Tennessee law, just asking the question, what responsibility do I bear then? Do I have to report this? Or even family getting too much involved in it can become dangerous to that family member. Mm -hmm. We're not even talking about a hairstylist or someone like that, so. I think I was maybe like 18 and I had a client who, she told me that coming to get her hair done was her only escape wow. and she was like my boyfriend actually beats on me and he only allows me to go outside rather to take the kids to the bus stop or for me to go get my hair done but I have to come right back in after that and that was like wow like I didn't even I would have never known so um it can be a big responsibility but with the, it being so much of a sisterhood and me loving my clients the way that I do, I just try to be there. What yeah, about you? absolutely. I mean, I think black women, our relationship with our hair is so nuanced mm -hmm. in a way where um, other people can't really understand the depths of that relationship. Sometimes there's adoration and love for our hair. Sometimes there's resentment and frustration when it comes to our hair. So I think just dealing with the range of that emotions attached to our hair and not really having that weight on your shoulders anymore was a huge impetus behind why I cut mine off. Stefan, you specialize in short haircuts. What is that emotional journey like for women as they're sitting in that chair? Well, it's funny because um, sometimes they're scared, mm. sometimes they're excited, uh, all the time they're nervous. Uh, but what I've what I found myself doing lately is making them a part of the process versus just sitting in the chair and me doing the entire cut. Um, whether they're cutting locks or long, beautiful tresses, I just grab a section, I hand them the shears, and I let them do the first cut. And the expression on their face when they do it, I'm allowing them to free themselves from this. 
And, um, so you turned it into an experience. Right. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> I've seen everything from laughs to tears. Mm -hmm. uh, I keep yeah. a box of tissue right there yeah. at my station just in case. I love that you guys are sharing this information. You're easy to access. Most of us typically go get our hair done or go into the barber or things like that. And so just by simply asking those questions, uh, how are you doing or is it okay do you think this is safe it's a great opportunity to see kind of like what's going on i do think that it is a lot on you to bear that to have to like be mandated reporters mm. but i also kind of understand you're on the front line i think it's like 11 percent of blacks don't even have insurance so we understand that therapy and mental health can kind of be expensive you know coming to see a therapist might be $150. A lot of people don't have that. So mm. I can go into the barber, get my hair done, you know, and talk about my problems. But at a certain point, you do have to say, okay, this is beyond me. I think that you should reach out to have some type of resources. Right. No, absolutely. And I think that in our community, we have done so well at portraying an image that everything is fine, whether that be the truth or not. So I think that there is power and vulnerability in those moments that we share with our hairstylists, with our barbers, um, if we don't have a therapist. So I think that the more we talk about it, the more comfortable we get with having these tough conversations, mm -hmm. the more we normalize being vulnerable and opening ourselves up to this sort of thing. According to uh, Behind the Chair, one in five hairstylists suffer from anxiety disorder. Are hairstylists equipped to handle their clients' mental and emotional dilemmas, and how can this impact their mental well-being as well? I think that as a stylist, you know, you know your zone of genius, right? You didn't go to school to be a therapist. You're not trained. So I think that, like I said, it is a great you're the first line of defense, but once you hear those things, being able to give those resources um, to your clients and being able to say, hey, I experienced something like that before, or I know someone that experienced like that before, and here are the resources that I can give you that can possibly help you in that same situation. Like the girl you said, that was the only time that she got a chance to get out was to get her hair done. You may be the only person that even can help her get those, get those resources. What about you? How same does it impact him. your mental health and what do you do? Um, sometimes I do get anxiety. Some some clients have gave me some slight anxiety. Getting off, I definitely want to just ride home in complete silence. And then I do, I do do yoga. So I'm really practicing resting and taking care of myself. As a therapist, I have to see a therapist because seeing clients is heavy. Right. Um, but I'm trained in that. I think it's super important for you as hairstylists and barbers to be able to have a, a safe place for for you to uh, unpack all of that, that you just had to endure yourself because it's a lot. I think that it's about the stigma attached to being vulnerable. Yes. And I think I highly that- I agree, highly agree. It's, it's yes. so true and I think it's so much easier to open up, to relate to a friend, a peer, somebody on your level where you feel like they can understand you as opposed to somebody you feel like is maybe judging you mm -hmm. or Doesn't somebody share. you feel- doesn't share, or yeah. maybe you feel like someone's diagnosing you, but right. conversations like this are so necessary, especially on this platform, mm -hmm. because we should be having these conversations with, with one another as well as a therapist. Data from the American Psychiatric Association shows that only 2% of psychiatrists and 4% of psychologists are black. So when we look at the comfort level of, you know, a person of color saying, I feel more comfortable pouring myself to my hairstylist than a therapist, kind of tell us about where those boundaries lie with resources that are out there where they can talk to someone who looks just like them. So you have resources like mine, you have uh, resources like Black Female Therapists, uh, Loveland Foundation that are paying for therapy for you. So you don't even have to go through, you know, you don't have to worry about how do I pay for it. We have resources now that are paying, that are giving access to people that low-income people or even not because i mean mm -hmm. you can have a job and 150 dollars a session is a lot it adds up you know every time so therapy sometimes i look at it like instructions uh, sometimes they go back into your childhood your past and help you work through some of those things because those things kind of help shape who we are today mm -hmm. um, so just giving you some different tools techniques different ways to look at situations um, conflict resolution all of those different things just great, great tools. And uh, for people who think they don't need it, I would say find a therapist that may do a free session for you, the first one. 
um, and just, you'd be surprised, you'd be surprised. It's so necessary that when we're in the chair or not in the chair, we're having these conversations about our mental health, about what our actual realities look like, so we can do something about them. Thank you all for your time, for sitting at this table, and for this conversation. Thank you.